Your Excellencies, the uh, Distinguished General Romel Dahia, our distinguished panelists and uh, members of the different delegations, ladies and gentlemen. As intimated by our moderator, uh, Professor Dr. Muni, I, I will try my best to compress the presentation to uh, the time allotted. But let me just um, state that the presentation will be uh, left with, with the organizers and you, you can access that uh, very easily. In the commemoration of the 20th anniversary of the ASEAN-India Dialogue Relations, the leaders of the ASEAN-India economies clearly acknowledge that the civilization of ASEAN in India have been enriched by cross-cultural exchanges over several millennia where knowledge and ideas, goods and spiritual traditions have moved seamlessly across borders. And along these lines, vowed to strengthen socio-cultural cooperation and promote greater people-to-people -people interaction through increasing exchanges in culture, education, youth, sports, creative industries, SNT, ICT, and human resource development, as well as scholarly exchanges, among others. And today, once more, there is a need to revisit the plans, the mandates of this cooperation and move to a post-2015 agenda. Because of the broadness of the topics, I will try to um, present some general overviews, state of play, uh, look at trends and emerging directions, and I will try to inject some insights likewise and some localized perspective. And then, uh, then uh, perhaps uh, a few words about the next steps or the way forward. Some talking points, the ASEAN India Partnership education and skills development, mutual recognition of degrees and qualifications, cultural linkages, and people-to-people -people contact. Our distinguished panelists will supplement, I suppose, some of the things that uh, I might miss in this presentation because, as I said, of the broadness of the subjects. Now, the ASEAN-India partnership, as I have articulated Yesterday, it's not just economic and commercial. More than that, it's about people. The, partner, the, the partnership is about shared common values of democracy, respect for civil liberties, and the rule of law. And it's also a venue for healthy and frank exchanges on political and security issues. The economies, the economies of ASEAN and India share crossroads culture, thus free flow of people's goods, cultures, and ideas happen. And definitely, the partnership will enrich the entire region. Our economies and regions must create and sustain a highly educated and innovative workforce and the capacity to generate and apply new knowledge supported through policies and investments in developing human capital technological innovation and entrepreneurial skills. I think this concept is central to the idea of the movement of people as well as the trade and investment liberalization that is uh, happening in the ASEAN and India sphere. Economic prosperity and social well-being in a global knowledge driven economy requires public investment in knowledge resources. It is this reality of the hyper-competitive global knowledge-driven economy of the 21st century that is stimulating the powerful forces that will reshape the nature of our society and that pose such a formidable challenge to the ASEAN and Indian partnership to become a key player in the world's scheme of things. Some thoughts about a knowledge-driven development process. As we all know, KBE requires at least four things, and that would require an educated and skilled labor force, a modern and adequate information infrastructure, 
an effective innovation system, and of course the country's overall business and governance framework which determine the flow of, of investment in the first three sectors. And these are basically interrelated factors that contribute to the evolution of a KBE where knowledge becomes the key engine of economic growth. What are some of the challenges that experts foresee nowadays? How to build a knowledge economy to drive and sustain growth? In recent seminars and conferences of the ADB and the World Bank, this has been uh, a recurring theme. Another would be what needs to be done in education and skills development, technological readiness and innovation to support KBE in the present context. What about competition policies and framework across high level, relatively few and skilled human resource? And this is an issue that was raised in one of the panel discussions yesterday in terms of the pooling of critical human resource in the region. Some developments to date in the Asia-India partnership the establishment of IT training centers have been uh, called for, the setting up of software development centers, technical assistance in IT curriculum development, as well as teacher training in IT. The leaders also ask for the support by India to enhance IT skills of ASEAN workforce through scholarships, joint training programs and courses, e-learning, seminars, workshops for public, private, personnel, and students, as well as exchanges of IT experts. Again, some of the challenges that have been noted while these things are going on are as follows. The shift to knowledge, innovation, and high-end services needed to advance the knowledge economy. There are some thought that economies tend to stagnate, of course, if they fail to I innovate and advance the level of their development in terms of uh, being a knowledge economy. Systematic investment in new ICT, manufacturing, and other technologies. Shift to smart energy grids, cloud computing, 3D manufacturing, mobile communications. The need to put in place mechanisms and adapt policies that enable innovation and creativity to flourish as well as increase in investment in research and development to create innovative competitive industries. Likewise, higher education and training need to be significantly improved to generate the skills and critical thinking processes vital to a modern competitive economy. Some trends focusing on mere raising li literacy levels towards skills required by the workforce to promote economic growth. Ensuring college and universities produce graduates with the right skills or workplace ready skills. Enhancing or expanding connectivity is something that a lot of uh, the economies are concerned with, as well as the increasing the capacity to innovate or increasing R&D investment. Improving quality and relevance of higher education. All of these pose challenges to the development of a KBE economy. In the area of technical vocational education, looking at the results of the Shanghai Consensus, building skills for work and life should be a top priority in the quest to build inclusive and greener societies and tackle global unemployment. Enhancing stakeholders' participation in governance and improving the relevance of TVET expanding access to it, improving quality and equity. Likewise, adapting qualifications and developing pathways to Tibet that provide young people with skills that are relevant to the labor market. Also, increasing investment in Tibet and diversifying financing, exploring the possibility of setting up international task forces to develop guidelines for recognition of qualifications and quality assurance, and, of course, rethinking the nature and roles of Tibet in contributing to more equitable and sustainable patterns of human development. 
on mutual recognition of degrees and qualification, a most relevant example would be the developments in the ASEAN uh, perspective or the ASEAN sphere. Now, the ASEAN MRA objectives are as follows. To facilitate mobility of practitioners with, within ASEAN, exchange information, enhance cooperation in respect of mutual recognition of practitioners, the promotion or adoption of best practices on standards and qualifications, as well as the provisioning or the provision of opportunities for capacity building and training of practitioners. What are some of the elements of the MRAs that has been uh, more or less concluded or agreed upon in, in, in the ASEAN? Well, the education and training would be relevant, the experience, as well as the acquired competencies in other uh, fora, in other venue, for example, in terms of certificates and licenses. And all of this, under a process, will be recognized and hopefully will result to the mobility of the so-called qualified professionals. In the ASEAN, at least in the ASEAN sphere, ASEAN member states may recognize education or experience and things, or the licenses. To date, there are at least seven areas where uh, MRAs have been uh, concluded. In engineering, nursing, surveying, architecture, dentistry, medicine, and accountancy. On the part of the Philippines, um, we, we have uh, done MRAs in the fields of dentistry, medicine, and nursing as part of the implementation of the ASEAN MRA. One of the exciting things that's happening now is the uh, ASEAN Qualifications Framework. And this is an important intervention because this will facilitate the mobility of qualified professionals across the economies across the region, and with the ASEAN plus India partnership, hopefully this can be extended to this partnership in the future. And, 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 and as a way forward, this is probably best tackled by a, a working group that will handle the processes, the, the principles and the policies in the um, upcoming or an emerging ASEAN-India qualifications reference framework. Just to give you an idea, in the ASEAN, um, this is how the qualifications uh, framework uh, look like. It is actually uh, a benchmarking tool, and uh, it is a, a tool where we compare the qualifications and competencies of um, the HR, of the human resource, across the member economies. And of course, uh, the purposes of the AQRF would be to support recognition of qualifications, to facilitate lifelong learning, promote and encourage credit transfer, as well as to promote worker or professional mobility. Uh, now, on, uh, on cultural uh, linkages, uh, it has been noted by scholars that uh, there is a long history of cultural linkages or linkage between India and the Southeast Asian region. Actually, the Indian influence can be found in cultural practices and religious events, the arts, scriptures, and even language. And one of the common cultural heritage shared is the celebration of major religious festivals with origins from India and are widely celebrated in the ASEAN. In the context of deepening ASEAN-India relations, as articulated in the chairman's statement of the 12th ASEAN-India Summit in November 2012, held in Myanmar, the leaders emphasized enhancement of cultural exchanges and the establishment of religious heritage sites in the region as a positive step in this direction. Likewise, the chairman's statement on the post-ministerial conference, 10 plus 1, sessions was quite encouraging when the meeting highlighted the need for cooperation in organizing meaningful cultural events and exchange programs that would advance mutual understanding of peoples in the region. I trust that uh, Dr. Uh, Rai will expound on this uh, in due time. The, well, we've mentioned about cultural exchanges, cultural events, and um, heritage sites. 
Now, some of the challenges facing or being faced by uh, economies are as follows. How to address the so-called cultural loss in ASEAN countries, how to achieve an orchestrated preservation of cultural heritage, or how to protect cultural heritage, cultural in, in, in indigenous people's rights. When it comes to people-to-people -people contact, again, in the context of strengthening the ASEAN-India relations, people-to-people -people initiatives, again, have regarded by our leaders as occupying a pivotal position in the partnership. Thus, in the chairman's statement in Myanmar, the leaders further highlighted the need to enhance people-to-people -people connectivity. And this connectivity would involve initiatives and exchanges on culture, education, media, and tourism. The leaders also underscored in their statement visa facilitation, among others, and agreed to intensify dialogues or dialogue on consular issues in evolving knowledge and skills initiatives and in the role of sporting events to link HEIs. Further, the leaders talk about linkages between and among institutions for healthcare, medicine, and even pharmaceuticals. Some insights, strengthening the people-to-people -people relations, which is basically the linchpin that will bind the ASEAN-India partnership, is an important ingredient in the process. More initiatives on non-governmental P2P or people-to-people -people relations institutionalized in the areas identified by the leaders and to flow to SNT research and ICT innovations would also be central to this partnership. Openness, mechanisms in the national context to hasten such people-to-people -people connectivity. Let me just um, um, mention a case in point. In, in the Philippines today, uh, the joint consular consultation meeting between Philippines and India is well underway and a lot of uh, discussion not only in visa facilitation schemes for students, businessmen and professionals have been done, but in other uh, concerns as well. One of the things that have been discussed would be the extension of a possible visa scheme for investors and retirees. Now, foreign students in the Philippines, it's an increasing phenomenon and about five years ago, we only have about 300 uh, Indian students, but to date, we have more than 2,000 Indian students enrolled in the different programs, especially in the health-related programs and medicine. Mobility of students, benchmarking and identifying best practices for ASEAN India on course accreditation and quality assurance systems, as well as targeted capacity building projects, should be put in the agenda in the post 2015 agenda. Developing models to guide reform and regulatory convergence, drawing on case studies of domestic education providers would be important, as well as exploring ways to increase the transparency, attractiveness, efficiency of student visa regulations in uh, member economies. In terms of mobility of researchers, de developing existing and academic exchanges and joint research activities among ASEAN and India HEIs, or higher education institutions, and exploring ways to improve mobility of the academic workforce. For education providers, exchanging best practices for market access and capacity building, mapping out existing regulations for the establishment of foreign providers, and the benchmarking and identification of best practices in, in quality system. What is our main recommendation? Well, in the context of sustaining the gains in human resource development as a key ingredient to economic prosperity and inclusive growth, we propose that um, in the post-2015 agenda, the adoption of a human resource development framework that would address multifaceted issues covering people, capacitation in critical areas, mobility of qualified human resources or professionals crucial to trade and investment liberalization as well as people-to-people -people connectivity.
for continuity, it is further proposed that this mechanism be shepherded through a technical working group that would be institutionalized and supported by the ASEAN-India partnership to ensure continuity, stability, and efficiency. Well, uh, that's all, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much.